somebody notices you and says, welcome today. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. <laughs> what a day. Good morning. <laughs> Focus up here, as I say in the classroom. Welcome to Chula Vista Presbyterian Church, where our mission is to know Christ and to Good job. We'd like to welcome our guest preacher this morning, Eliseo Morales Jr. He's a Navy chaplain, and he will be he is currently assigned out at MCRD, lucky guy. And we welcome him, give him a warm welcome after the service, please. If the attendance, uh, there was a note in the blast to sign the cards at the end of each pew. However, if you signed it, they had the checklist in the back too. If you signed both, you get extra credit. So, <laughs> let us prepare our hearts for worship. Stand please and join me in the call to worship that's found in the bulletin. Lord, we have come this day seeking your presence and healing love. Be with us as we hear the words of the hope and compassion. Give us courage to learn and to grow. Come, let us worship the Lord. Amen. And join together in our opening hymn. Be thou my vision, number 339. <clears throat>
psalmist reminds us, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. With this knowledge, we may confess our sins before God and one another with confidence. Join together in our confession. God of love and power, we listen to the stories of miracles and doubt that these things can happen today. We look at the waves of misfortune, distress, misery, distrust, and anger, and wonder how we can still win. We feel the pressures of power and fear flooding into our lives, threatening to drown us, and wonder where you are. Forgive us for the littleness of our faith. Forgive us our doubts. Help us to place our trust in you, Lord Jesus. Hear now our silent confessions. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Join now for the hymn of reflection. God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
May the peace of Christ be with you. Would the ushers please come forward? Let us be reminded that God has commanded us to give and let us do so. God, we thank you so much for these blessings. We thank you because you have blessed us and continue to bless us. I ask that you take these offerings, Lord, and bless those who are able to give and those who are not. May we use these according to your will, Lord, to continue your mission here on earth until you return. Be with us now and always. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Every church is different, so I apologize for that. Now is the time for prayers of the people. Does anybody have any prayer requests that they would like to share? No? You're praying? Yes. Yeah. I've never been to a church where everybody's life is perfect. Amen. Well, God knows spoken and unspoken prayers. Is that right? And I trust that God hears our prayers. And the beautiful part about our faith is that Scripture tells us that we can pray for each other. And God hears those prayers and takes them into account. So let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning. We thank you that even though daylight saving times is a struggle, we can still gather together. Lord, you know each and every person in this room. You know their wants and their needs. I ask that you hear their silent prayers and that you answer them according to your will, trusting that you are the author and perfecter of our life. Guide us and help us to continually trust in you, Lord, and despite all that we see going on around the world, Lord, whether it's Russia or Ukraine or any other crisis, we trust that you are doing something in there. In the midst of that chaos, help us trust in you. Though we may not see it, help us have faith, Lord, that you are doing something new every single day. I pray for all my brothers and sisters here. Be with us now and always. Amen. Oh, the Lord's Prayer. Pray with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join now together and sing hymn number 310. Jesus, the very thought of thee, stand to us.
Let us now open our hearts to God's word. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rises up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of the tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above the enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with joy, shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off and do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a path, a level path, because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, or false witnesses have risen against me and they are the breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the Lord, see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of God. The second passage comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Hear now for the word of the Lord. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose. Oh, other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the, uh, even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for uh, being here with me and suffering through daylight savings time. I know it's not easy. And for some reason, we never get used to it, right? I've been doing this for many years now, and still every morning. So I'm running on the Holy Spirit and coffee. So if you see me yawning, it's not because I'm bored or I'm not interested. It's because I'm right there with you. Uh, but it's truly my pleasure to be here. As, uh, as was mentioned, I am a Navy chaplain, and I'm stationed at MCRD. I did work in churches for a very long time, uh, and I love the church. I miss the church, but I also love Navy chaplaincy. Uh, and it's really, truly my pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, the McCalls are good family friends. Uh, they have always been good family friends to my family, not just in ministry, but uh, in our personal lives. So for that, I am very grateful, uh, very kind people. So when they asked me to come here, uh, if I had remembered that it was Daylight Saving Sunday, I would have said no, that I was busy. <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm happy to be here. Uh, and, I, and I'm uh, always up for it, assuming my schedule allows me. Uh, but yes. Uh, it's crazy because the McCalls met me when I was in my early 20s or even younger than that. Uh, before I even took up my ordination test to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church. And now here I am, 32 years old, married with two kids, uh, and then Navy chaplaincy. So to me, it is a reminder that 
God is faithful, but that also time passes by a lot faster than one would want or wish, right? Uh, but life is good, and I really enjoy it. And I, I enjoy my job at MCRD. So if you don't know, it's the Marine Recruit Training. Any military persons here? Retired? Hurrah. Thank you for your service. Any sailors? Only the ones that matter. Uh, everyone else? Thank you, I guess. Just kidding. I always say Jesus would have been a sailor because uh, he used, you know, fishermen. Uh, but you never know. He might have joined the Air Force or the Army. I'm not sure. But I love my job there. And the best part about it is that I get to work with recruits. And for the most part, they're 17, 18, 19 year olds who are fresh out of high school or have attempted to, you know, do life outside of high school, trying to do uh, whatever it is nowadays, believe it or not. Uh, the biggest thing that youth want to do is, you know, not go to college, but become influencers on social media. Very quickly, they learn that that's not easy. So they spend a year trying to figure it out. And then they're like, okay, I need some direction in life. And they up in the military. Uh, and my favorite part of, of job of that, or part of my job, is that if you can guess, and you probably know this and believe this, their biggest struggle early on is not having their phone. You know, for the first time in their life, they are without a phone. And to some part, it's their fault, but to another, you know, COVID, for these people who are 18, 17, for the last two and a half years of their life, everything has been online, right? Whether it's school, meeting with family, whatever it is, they are just attached to their screen. And they don't know anything else. Some of their most formative years are with their phones and it's become essential to them. So for a lot of them, to be without their phone, it's almost like being off a drug, right? And we see that. We see that within the first seven days, they are contemplating, you know, is this for me? And when I talk to them, it's not because, you know, I mean, they are homesick and they don't like sharing with 40 other people. Uh, no one could ever get used to that. Um, but we see that it's, it's the phone that they miss. Um, and they really miss it. But once we dig deeper into it, it's not so much that they miss their phone. It's that their phone was a good way to escape the realities of life. A lot of these young people have trauma. And they have a lot of things that have happened in their life. So rather than knowing how to handle life's situations, they're very quick to take their phone out and numb the pain. Right? Numb their situation. Whatever it is, you know, you can always find uh, an escape, a little oasis in your phone. Or watching TV, binging is very popular. You know, you just sit there and watch a show for hours and hours a day. But the moment they step into recruit training, that's gone. That distraction is gone. Uh, what they used to use to escape reality and the difficulties of life is no longer there. So for them, for the first time in their young adult lives, it is a fight to, to handle those repressed memories, those uh, repressed traumas. Not, that's not all of them, but for, for a good part of them. And they're finally, for the first time in their life, learning how to handle those situations. And that's where I get to step in, where I get to help them strengthen their spirituality, uh, their spiritual fitness, as we like to say, not so much religious, but also faith, community, personal, whatever it may be. So every day for me is Sunday, and I love it. Um, but for them, those 13 weeks that's there, it's, it's almost like Lent. Um, if you didn't remember, we are in a season of Lent. Uh, if you're anything like me, you forgot that it's Lent. So if you gave up something and forgot that it's Lent, you probably went back to it. For me, it was coffee. So here's my coffee. Um, <laughs> so I forgot that it was Lent, like two, two days in, and then I drank coffee, and I said, well, all right, there's always next year. But because for us, it's not a sacrament, it's okay. Yeah. God's not mad at us. There's grace for that. Uh, but for them, uh, those 13 weeks, uh, it's, it's a reminder of grief, right? Life's uh, struggles. Uh, someone's yelling at them. They do push-ups at odd, odd times of the day. Uh, for us, Lent is a reminder that there's a lot of chaos in this world. Right? There's a lot of chaos. So this Lenten journey is a reminder that we are heading towards the resurrection and the celebration of Easter. And in those 40 days, we are asked to contemplate on life's, uh, on the grief that life can bring. And if for some reason you're struggling to find a reason for the resurrection, for the, re uh, for the celebration of Easter, I highly encourage you to do something as simple as turn on the news. Doesn't matter if it's Fox, CNN, uh, whatever news outlet you use, they will tell you that crazy things are happening, right? And on top of all that, you know, we're in this new era of misinformation of we don't know who to trust. 
one news source tells you one thing, another one tells you another, and then what you read for your personal uh, fulfillment says another thing. So we're just at a loss of who to believe, what do we believe, where do we go, and there's chaos. And as you mentioned, you know, there's the Russia, Ukraine, but that's just one of the many wars that's going on. It's just highlighted the most. And then we get into our personal lives where there's also chaos going on, right? There's also political tension, not just in the States, but around the world. And then the cost of living is skyrocketing San Diego a lot, but all over the, the country. It's making it impossible, not just you know, to fill up your gas tank, but for an entire generation of people like myself to even attempt to buy a house. So this progress of financial stability is even lengthened a lot harder. There's a lot of chaos in this world, is there not? There's a lot of reasons to desire the resurrection and the celebration of Easter. Um, but we're here on the Lenten journey. So when I was thinking about what passage to, to read with you all, to talk with you all about, this one came to mind. And it's not part of our liturgy uh, or in our liturgical calendar, but I believe it speaks uh, straight into our lives, into our situations. Uh, and here in this passage, we find Jesus and his 12 disciples. And if you were to just read it as itself, from chapter 4, from 35 to 41, it, it seems like it's just another passage. But sometimes our Bible tricks us and it breaks up the, the, the chapters and it says, you know, Jesus did this and that. But this, this occurrence is just one part of a very long day for Jesus. If we look back, this day started in chapter 3, as early as chapter 3. And Jesus has been walking from the synagogue to the uh, uh, seashore and he goes to the mountain and then he goes to his house and along the way people are following him and they're bringing them the sick and the demon possessed and scripture tells us that uh, at one point the entire city was following him and Jesus was healing and praying and teaching and at that point Jesus is exhausted so if you've ever felt like does Jesus know what a long day feels like the answer is yes so my first point is take a break. Because here we see that Jesus says, I need to get away from these people. I need some rest. Because although Jesus is fully divine, he's also fully human. His body has limits. So he tells his disciples, hey, let's go to the other Sea of Galilee. Um, and in between this shore and the next, we're going to find rest. Because if you turn the page to chapter 5, it says, as soon as they step off the boat, immediately, scripture says, a demon-possessed man came and met them. So his break was literally from shore to shore, and that's where he got his rest. And that's why we see Jesus sleeping. The first thing he does is sleep. Now the request to go across the, the sea isn't a difficult one. Uh, by this point, Jesus already has his 12 disciples. And out of the 12, four of them are fishermen. They're sailors. And this, isn't a, uh, this time isn't a time in the world where you know, kids go to middle school, high school, attempt a degree, and you know, if it didn't work out, so I'm going to go into the family business of fishing. No, they've been fishermen their entire lives. This is a family trade, so they've been fishermen and sailors for a good chunk of their life. So when Jesus finds Peter, Andrew, James, and John, he literally finds them fishing with their father. And they abandon their father, they abandon their, their uh, trade, their family business, and they go and follow Jesus. So when Jesus says, take this small boat, let's go to the other side, four of them, four of the twelve, a third of the group, knows what they're doing. They're confident in their ability, right? Jesus says, let's sail, good to go, let's sail. The other eight are just sitting, I guess, hanging out, talking. But off they go. And to add to it, Jesus is with them. The Son of God. We read in Mark, uh, in Mark 1, after his baptism, that the heavens open up and God anoints Jesus as his son to fulfill the mission. And not only that, these disciples have been walking with Jesus along this uh, ministry where Jesus is healing people. Uh, right before this, in chapters uh, 2 and 3, we see the great things that God is doing. A man with a withered hand, if you all remember that story, who had a withered hand, God restores it. A man with leprosy, God, or Jesus cleanses him. And the scripture says that people with all various diseases come to Jesus and Jesus heals them, and the demons are cast out of people. So the uh, disciples are first-hand witnesses to the glory and greatness and the miracles that Christ is making and doing. And then aside from that, 
Christ anoints the twelve. And not only does he anoint them, he gives them the power to cast out demons, uh, Scripture tells us. So not only are they confident in their abilities to sail this boat, they also have Jesus, who has proven that he is more than just a man. And they have been empowered to do miracles themselves. Jesus says, let's get across the sea, let's take a break, good to go. So off they went. And the, ne- the very next scene, Scripture tells us that immediately, suddenly, this big storm comes out of nowhere. And the disciples are panicking. Again, a third of the crew are sailors. They know what they're doing, but to the best of their ability, they cannot keep this boat from sinking. A third is trying to maneuver or handle the ship, the boat, and then eight of them, the other eight are hopefully trying to get the water out of the boat with buckets or whatever it is. But no matter their efforts, no matter their abilities, no matter their skills, they are unable to keep this boat afloat. And we aren't told how long the disciples wait until they wake up Jesus, but they know that they wake him up. And they're angry. They're frustrated. They're desperate. And we know this because the way in which they ask says a lot about their mental, emotional, and spiritual situation. They say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The audacity to ask such a question is both incomprehensible, yet very relatable. Because after all they have witnessed, after all they have seen Christ do, they have walked with Jesus, they have been empowered by Jesus, they strip Jesus of his divinity, they strip Jesus of his glory, they strip Jesus of his sonship from God, and instead of respectfully saying, Lord, they say, Teacher, they have reduced Jesus to a teacher because despite all that they have seen, despite all that they have done, this storm, this situation is too much for their abilities and too much for their faith to handle. And at that moment, they are in doubt. And everything that they believed about Jesus is now reduced to him being just a teacher. Teacher, do you not care that we are actively dying? Do you not care that this ship is sinking? And if we bring it to today, we can say, teacher, although we want to say, God, or Lord, do you not care what's going on in the Middle East? Do you not care or do you not see what's going on in Russia and Ukraine? Do you not care or do you not see that there are children dying of hunger all around the world? Do you not see what's going on in the creation that you have made? And if we bring it to our personal lives, we say, God, do you not care what I'm going through? Do you not care that I'm struggling with depression, anxiety, loneliness, helplessness? Do you not care that I'm drowning in debt and the bills continue to come because the companies don't care? Because the bank doesn't care. Do you not care that my children are straying further and further away from you? Do you not care that my grandchildren are struggling? Do you not care about the financial situation of this world or the politics of this country? Do you not care, Lord? Do you not care that your church is perishing? As it dwindles down, I was told that this church at some point had 400 members. God, do you not care? Do you not see... So this question that's incomprehensible to ask is all of a sudden very relatable, is it not? Teacher, do you not care about our situation? And some of us have been fighting storms for a very long time or know of someone that has been and we're depending on our abilities like the disciples were. They were doing their best, they were trying their hardest, they were, they were executing all that they have learned from their fathers to how to sail a boat, to how to handle life stressors. But despite their best ability, despite our best ability, the ship is sinking. It's going down. 
sort of anger and frustration. We cry out to God and we say, do you not care what's going on in this world? Do you not care what's going on in my life? Do you not care what's going on in this church? And out of frustration, we cry out. And here's the beauty of our faith. Here's the good news of this story is that when Christ hears their cries, Christ wakes up and instead of rebuking them, instead of saying, where is your faith? Why are you of doubt? Have you not seen what I have done? And all of a sudden you're doubting me. He says, peace, be still. Christ answers the prayer before he questions their doubt. Because Christ is reminding the disciples, Christ is reminding us that we don't need to have a perfect faith. We don't need to have a flawless worship life. We don't need to be perfect disciples. These disciples had witnessed everything firsthand. Here we are hearing the stories. We don't need to be perfect in our faith journey. Because when we cry out to God, God is faithful to answer, yes. Yes, I care. Peace. Be still. For them, it was a storm that they were in. And for us, it's the storms that we are in. Whatever those storms may be, I don't know your situation, but Christ knows your situation. He knows the situations of your family. He knows whatever you're going through, whether it be yours personally or your friends, those who you care about, Christ knows. So that when we ask, do you care? We have the confidence that God wakes up or that God intervenes and says, yes, I do. Peace, be still. So brothers and sisters, May we live with this truth. The truth is this, that God is with us in all situations, the good and the bad. And despite our best ability, we have to remember that all we need to do is cry out because even a cry is a prayer. And God is faithful to say yes. Yes, I care. Peace be still. May we find peace in this truth. God is with us. We need only to cry out and call upon him. And God will be faithful to answer in the middle of our storms. I pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand, <clears throat> Let us stand and sing together. Hymn number 477, Ye Servants of God, Your Master Proclaim.
May you go out into this world knowing that whatever struggles, whatever storms you may face and are facing, God is with you. And when we cry out, Lord, do you not care? May you rest in the truth that God's answer is yes. Peace. Be still. May the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.